Maybe it's true that some gay people find fulfilment in buying into the heteronormative institution of marriage. But that will always be a minority of that community. It'll be those who are in stable, committed, and monogamous relationships. It'll be those who have economic stability, and it'll be those who didn't feel so rejected by society from birth um, that they were happy to buy into the institution that was a flagship of, the, of that community's oppression for the, last thousand, uh, for the last hundreds of years. We're not saying that in a perfect world this wouldn't be a good idea, but we think that in the context in which it causes attempts to repeal oppressive laws uh, to, to, to deconstruct homophobic narratives and to liberate generations of people like who feel their basic identity is filthy and wrong. When it fails to do those things, by contrast, we think in that world, marriage equality should be a priority that is far down the list. But even if queer people should integrate, they would never be able to change that institution of marriage. Why? That's because it's historically tied, no thank you, to the perception of a nuclear family, right? We know that like, it's taken us over a century to break down the perception that women are domestic nice. house slaves. No thank you, and we still haven't fully done it. If that was ever reclaimed, it would have taken centuries, and those centuries of political capital and etc. No thank you, could have been used elsewhere. But secondly, we by nature think that it's centred around things that the gay community either can't have or they don't want. We think that's things like uh, being able to be an individual family unit that's accepted by the rest of society. We think that when they're not accepted, they can't change that. But we also think it's hard to deconstruct narratives about children, which by the sheer nature of genetics, gay people can't have, and it's not easy to just say that they can adopt, because that is something that they often don't want to do because they have no genetic relationship with those kids, or at least one parent doesn't. What do we support on this side of the house? We think, in terms of the freedom, supposedly, that's achieved by this, we think the political We're capital nation. expended is far up more than that. No, thank you. We think that's a waste. We think it's a detracted from a few priorities. Four things. Firstly, like fighting homophobic narratives. That's things that happen in the streets. That's things that happen in workplace places. We think, secondly, the attempts to, replay, uh, to repeal actively oppressive laws. For examples, firstly, adoption, where gay people can't adopt in Queensland. Queen secondly, Nation. gay panic laws, no thank you, where you can literally kill in Queensland, in South Australia, someone on suspicion of hitting on you. But thirdly, not being able to donate blood all throughout Australia. Fourthly, the fact that the age of consent for sodomy in Queensland for gay people is two years above normal. But thirdly, education for gay youth, right? We think things like active safe ed, safe, safe ed things like safe schools, counselling of uh, like teen gay people who come out, no thank you, but fourthly, we think persecution in other countries, places like Uganda, places like Saudi Arabia, where people literally receive the death penalty for being gay. Two questions in substantive. Firstly, why is this a colonisation of heteronormative institutions which is bad for the queer community? And secondly, why does this actively, no thank you, undermine attempts to emancipate the queer community? On the first of these, why like this is not a good goal for uh, uh, the gay movement? The first thing we'll note here is that ma like marriage will always be a system of a heteronormative society. Why is that? Firstly, no thank you, because it valorises characteristics which began in the heterosexual community. We think things like monog monogamy are good examples of this. Clearly, not all, like, it's not that no gay people want to be monogamous, but one of the most freeing parts of this like, movement was this being able to be pr promiscuous and re re reject oppression. Now that's important because it acknowledges a split between that movement and what it does is it doesn't necessarily help More those, no thank you, who, want, who don't want to be monogamous so they can do that anyway. We think it traps those who do in this movement. But secondly, we think it's always going to be a tool of patriarchal oppression. We give the example of women being uh, like oppressed because they could have no consent. We say that even now, women are coerced into marriage More by society. And I'll take you in a second. And they like, like that institution is one that's used for domestic violence, etc., and we think that women like still have to do domestic labour for no pay. We think that's terrible, but on why it's specifically important to this point, first, Tristan. The reason why homophobia exists is because at its root, people are able to look at that relationship and say that it is illegitimate. Do you think that is easier or harder to do when the state itself is refusing to acknowledge the legitimacy of that relationship? We just don't think that's true, right? We don't think people like base their opinions. We think that like right now, like 73% of Australians think that that's symbolically a legitimate thing, but they don't like the way that it affects them. I'm about to tell you my second point, why you make that so much worse under your side of the house. No, thank you. 
But secondly, we think that like some patri like in the patriarchy has kept gay men closeted for so many years. When they can't, cannot, like re they should always reject that narrative. They should never try and integrate into it. But onto the most important issue in this debate, my second point of substantive: what actively prevents the emancipation of the queer community. Mm -hmm. Firstly, no thank you, we point out that literally nothing has been achieved within the gay marriage community, or it's extremely small. We say that everywhere you look, very little has been achieved. We say even when you look at places like the US, where they've made unconstitutional to ban gay marriage, we think that took very little effort. It didn't require the huge amounts of social capital, no thank you, which we think they need. We think in other nations, like legislative changes have been incredibly slow. We think in Australia, it's taken us a decade to get a party which is willing to hold a conscience vote. That, like that took us eight years, no thank you. But we think that even now we still have a non-binding plebiscite which is trying to determine what we already know 70%, 72% of Australians want. But why does this goal itself achieve very little, even if it was like quite successful? We think because it brings limited benefits to only a few, right? As I We're flagged in my introduction, no thank you. It's to the people who are like economically stable, it's to the people who weren't rejected by society from birth. It's rich white men, Madam Speaker. But we think that also civil unions are already able to achieve many of the benefits that like gay marriage, like, well, marriage equality supposedly achieves. We think the sorts of legal rights from breakups, inheritances, etc., you still get through civil unions. That means we think that it's only a symbolic opting into of the patriarchy, which we don't want to support on team affirmative. But why is this actively counterproductive, furthermore, to the gay movement? Firstly, like this is so important, and I'll take you in a second, because we think it is mutually exclusive to other concessions that that movement can get. Firstly, we think that's because of political capital and specific types of it. Sure. It's true that 70% of the country currently gets around homosexual uh, around the homosexual community. Do you think that that was happening before the fight for marriage equality, or do you think that that fight actually galvanised everyday members of society to ally with the movement? No, we think we could have got it in the ways that we suggest under our side of the house. We think we could have got it even quicker, but we think that that 72% would actually be converted into change, not just conscience votes that don't do anything. But on this like political capital, right, it means you lose things like lobbying powers. It means you lose things like lawyers and court challenges. Like, that's really problematic. But secondly, it loses wait, wait, so much, no thank you, because it strikes at the centre of what like conservatives want. Their family, Mr Speaker, and their idea of their family, and secondly, their freedom to practise their religion. But we think that it also mobilises those conservatives and it also mobilises the people who are typically on the middle ground, right? So 72% of Australians who may have been sympathetic to like same-sex marriage, but also like because when those things of like family and religion bring it in, they like like go against it everywhere else. We think that means that they would have otherwise opposed things like shelters for gay people, like safe schools, it means they don't under their side of the house. But secondly, the focus has allowed opponents to double down into other areas, things like safe schools, Mr. Sp uh, Madam Speaker, which was effectively a policy that was repealed, which gave counselling to gay kids kicked out of their house by their parents. But the third thing we say in this point is that their side of the house leads to a massive culture of slacktivism, right? It allows you to just change your DP on Facebook and think you've done something for the movement. That means that you have far less ability to campaign for change in the future, right? The second example that we give that other than changing your DP is the commercialisation. Of it, right? We think that's really, really problematic because it stops you from being able to get further concessions and further gains for that gay movement in the future. Because we were the team who recognised that it wasn't a good goal for the queer movement to buy into heteronormative cultures of marriage and because it made the, their fight for other concessions like, repeat, like having safe schools and education for kids and like stopping gay people from being beaten up on the streets, we were so proud to propose. to achieve such as safe schools such as like less discrimination could not be achieved through marriage like without marriage equality here is why ladies and gentlemen to make it very very clear to you all when you want to progress a movement you need the movement to be accepted by the wider community you need a movement to be like embraced by people such that it's normalized in their undercurrent through their structures right you cannot radically join a movement and radically promote something without buying into the, like the ideolo ideology to an extent to promote it because you cannot like promote the ideas of like anti-discrimination without having like an like a negative term to understand like what marriage like what 
constitutes a gay person, and this comes when you have marriage equality, something which is relatable for most of society, and something which is able to like get the straight people around the gay community, and subsequently allow for more progression. And it is because it's that we oppose the affirmative team's case on the grounds that marriage equality is uniquely important in helping the gay community. The use of resources in the past has been very, very good, and no thank you, to make it very, very clear, we support the status quo, which has led to a good trajectory of change, where we are seeing, after marriage equality, more progression into the things that they wanted to talk about. Because we would contend that things like safe school would not have occurred if you had people like not get around the um, gay marriage movement, which has happened in the status quo. So tonight I have two issues of rebuttal, no thank you. Firstly, whether or not like the trajectory you have to buy into, like the trajectory is contingent on you buying into the patriarchal norms. And secondly, whether or not like their comparative is actually like um, like independent or like, no, no thank you, not dependent on our marriage equality. So onto this first issue of rebuttal, which is basically pertaining to the idea of whether or not trajectory is achieved when you buy into the system. So the opposition, no thank you, would like, would have you believe that like gay, mar uh, gay people didn't buy into marriage, right? We would firstly disagree with this because we think that gay people do value the idea of marriage because of the fact that they think it's very sacred. They think it's the idea of committing to your life. This is inherently patriarchal. This is, no thank you, this is like something that's really important because like homosexuality is defined with your relationship with respect to another person. And we think that marriage is a very, very normal way to do this. This is really good. Secondly, we redefine the binary of marriage through like creating this marriage equality because like you are literally like stopping like marriage from being defined in terms of like a male and a female in a relationship no thank you and other things so no thank you so we create a new marriage of like new meaning of marriage and therefore stop the patriarchal like the construction of marriage and subsequently we fix the structure so um onto the idea that like um the opposition's talked about about how marriage is sent around certain things we think that in order to deconstruct such norms you need to firstly like work your way into the like how the system's functioning that is to have marriage equality no thank you Therefore, to achieve things like safe schools, because we think that safe schools is like less valid unless you have like something to ground it upon, which is like something that straight people can relate to, which is marriage equality. So therefore, um, and to quickly address their idea of no thank you of civil unions, they come from the push of marriage equality. It was a compromise, and even then, civil unions aren't as fulfilling as marriages. They're really, really like like less fulfilling to marriages, such that like it isn't about like a commitment to your life. And we think that this is a really important thing that gay people wanted, and this is a really important thing that they denied. And we think this is absolutely abhorrent. So quickly onto the idea of Uganda and how like Uganda, no thank you, will still continually oppress people. We think that when you provide a clear stance on where the state stands in marriage equality, or like the gay movement, which is to empower gay people, we think that this leads to less hypocrisy within like the ideas of where Western democracies stand. And therefore they're able to push these like less hypocritical opinions and sound more valid in front of the nations like Uganda about oppression. This is really important, this is what we achieve, this is really good. So just quickly onto this second issue of rebuttal, which is like whether or not their goal is attainable without marriage equality. So basically like they were fighting for like um like their comparative like fights for like safe schools and all these other things. But no thank you. We think that firstly, um gay marriage like was the most important thing. This is why this movement fought for it in the first place. Secondly, their goals are very unattainable without this marriage equality, as I'll explain in my substantive. No thank you. And thirdly, your goals are more valid and more like relatable through marriage equality. And um, now I'm gonna move on to my points as a substantive. Firstly, why marriage equality is the most important goal for the gay community. Um, so, firstly, um, being, and I'll take you down. Marriage equality has a unique power to mobilise conservatives, but also push moderates towards those ideas because it attacks the conceptions of family and religious practices. Are you happy and do you think it's a good use of the gay community's resources to mobilise opposition that makes all change in the future so much harder? Okay, so we think that marriage equality does lead to good change because you were literally like redefining the structure. You were literally like helping marriage equality. Now I'll deal with this later, but for, like back onto my substantive, being like lesbian or gay by promoting marriage equality. No, thank you. The state is like formalizing, formally recognizing who you are as an identity because we think homosexuality is defined by your relationships with another person. Therefore, like the most important part is when the state like formally recognizes this through like ideas of marriage equality because this is like about the bond between another what person. This is really important. No, thank you. To deny this, you are literally denying gay people their identity, and your comparative does not solve <coughs> solve this important part. In fact, it like does not deal with the issues of homosexuality. Um, really important. So, secondly, as a consequence of this, you are like seeing under our um, under our world as like an equal by broader society. No, thank you. This is important because like. People follow the lead of the state, people base their ideals by the state. Therefore, like you're engaging more people when you like normalize the perception of homosexuality through
through things like marriage equality. So the state legitimately recognises you as a person, what and you're like, no, thank you, stopping like the ambiguity and hypocrisy within the states who like might not support marriage equality but support civil unions under their side. So therefore, when we have a unified stance that is to like empower gay people, then that means that people are legitimately able to get around the state's ideals and be better like able to embrace the gay community. So marriage equality, thirdly, affects like the majority of people in the gay community. So they're all subject to marriage, not all of them are necessarily subject to bullying. This means that this policy will like help on net the most people. Fourthly, like the benefits of marriage, as I've already mentioned, are like they make you feel happy. They make you feel like the right to like commit to your life to someone. This is really, really important. You deny this right to people, and also no thank you. Um we like there's all these other benefits to marriage, like such as like like tax benefits and all these other things. No thank you. Fifthly, like in this point, the most homophobic discourse comes from like religious institutions, therefore like this policy delineate, no, thank you, delineate, delineates the state from religion such that this policy shows how the state recognises how the, like religion shouldn't necessarily dominate how you perceive sexual identity. It, no, no, thank you, it inherently makes like, like the state like less biased and less secular, um, more secular, this is really important. Um, and I'll take you, Xavier. Do you honestly believe that progressives who rally in support of gay marriage wouldn't also rally in support of bullying programs for gay youth? Um, okay, so we think that like by having marriage equality, as I'll get to get into on our second point, we think that by having this marriage equality, you are able to ground discussion, ground discourse, and therefore like able to perpetuate um, marriage discussion. I'll get onto this soon. So at the end of this point, basically like people, the gay people wanted marriage equality, and this led to better outcomes. So quickly on just, um, the second point is substantive: why marriage equality garnered the greatest benefits for the gay community. So we think that like an unwasteful use of resources is defined as like some. Um, as something that's attainable, leads to positive outcomes. This is really important. So the success of the marriage equality movement is really like overwhelming at the moment. So basically, like tons of nations endorse this. Straight people have gotten around the idea of marriage equality because like you provide this clear goal for gays. It's less abstract as like a no bullying law. Um, it's something that like um, straight people are able to emphasize, empathize with, and this is really important. So we provide, we provide a relatable reference point for individuals to perceive what homosexuality is. This is really important. They didn't fix this. Um, and essentially, like, basically, this clear, um, this clear goal for a fractional movement is really important because we acknowledge that homosexuals aren't a homogenous group, but when you have this clear goal, basically what happens is that, like, it's best for the perception and, like, to take a grounded approach, and this is really, really important. So their comparative um, benefits that they wanted to mention are better quantified and relatable when you ground them in something relatable, such as um, marriage. And this normalises like, and promotes acceptance and allows this trajectory to continue because you're like, changing the perception of marriage is not, not a heteronormative thing. This is really important. So finally, at the time, this is most achievable and like, it was big enough to be a success, but it wasn't radical enough for people to like, backlash it. This is why, because we helped the gay community the best, because we allowed them to feel empowered. We are the team that's proud to oppose. Thank you. To buy this bizarre and undercooked claim that gay marriage was somehow the first step of trajectory for the emancipation of the queer community, what the negative team had to do was point to something that was unique about the fight for gay marriage and the narratives of queer emancipation that it prioritised that couldn't just the same be applied to all the things we supported. It was in the same way that advocating for gay marriage allowed the gay lobby to say things like we are just the same as everyone else or we deserve the same rights as everyone else Advocating for the same age of consent for homosexual sex could you allow you to do those exact same narratives. There was nothing unique about gay marriage as a tool of reform, but even to the extent there was, that was a tool that always oppressed more gay people. That was extended to a degree of ludicrosity by this negative team because they literally claimed that the reason that Somalia executes gay people is because there's marriage equality hasn't been legislated enough in the world. I don't think it's important, I think it's quite important to note here the ridiculousness of the claim that the moderates in Somalia, or gay activists in Somalia, are just waiting out for Australia to legislate marriage equality such that they can stop the oppression of that government. That's ludicrous. Two questions in rebuttal. Firstly, is marriage equality a good goal for the queer community? And secondly, does it emancipate queer people? No, thank you. Firstly, is it a good goal? 
they tell us that a lot of gay people find fulfillment in like having marriage and feeling like their relationships are just the same as everyone else. And that was wholly uncontemplative of the analysis that we gave you at first affirmative. That was a clear narrative we brought you, which is to say that, sure, some people, some gay people find that empowering. Because those are firstly, the sort of gay people who have the economic stability and who have the stability of a committed and monogamous relationship to find that empowering. But secondly, and much more importantly, those are the gay people who didn't feel so rejected by society from the day that they were born that they feel comfortable buying back into one of the biggest flagships of that society. We need to hear a proper response to that incredibly important claim. Secondly, they claim they're going to redefine the binary and redefine the institution of marriage. But again, we gave responses and we gave reasons why you could never do that that got literally no acknowledgement. Those were twofold. It was firstly because the historical shadows of the oppression of the heteronormative institution of marriage was so firmly attached to that. It was because those were historical shadows that were incredibly difficult to engage from. We pointed to the we pointed to the institution of marriage as in terms of an enslavement of women. But secondly, marriage was predicated on some things that the gay community could never really access or probably never really wanted to access. And that was things like being accepted by the rest of society, but also the ability to have children who were genetically your own. Thirdly, has this movement even worked? And this was probably one of the more in questions in this debate, because even to the extent that we conceded there was a goal that should be prioritised, they didn't actually get it for the reasons they said. We heard the assertion that there have been lots of countries that have legislated gay marriage, but again, we gave responses to this in substantive. Those were countries that either legislated as a result of judicial activism, see the largest country in which gay marriage has been allowed, or secondly, those were, result, those were efforts that would always be installed, as they had in Australia, by series of conscience votes and political foot dragging. Secondly, on the emancipation of the queer community. They make a bold and overarching claim here, which is to say that this says that queer relationships are legitimate. We have four key responses. No thank you. Firstly, what a bizarre conception it is of queer rights that the origins of homophobia and the reason that gay people have been oppressed for centuries was because the government hadn't told them that their love was worthwhile. No, that's not what happens. The response of homophobic people, people who believe that those relationships will never be legitimate, is not to accept what the state tells them. That response is to say that the state is wrong, that the state doesn't understand those religious narratives, and to fight back aggressively against the state. And the only way they do that is fighting back aggressively at gay people themselves. That was horrific. But at best, that was social change that took place over centuries and over dozens of generations. Dozens of generations in which a small number of privileged gay men, largely, would benefit from the benefits, would accrue the benefits of being able to have marriage, whilst millions of queer youth died in fear and in terror because the government and their lobby that was meant to protect them had failed them. But also, every benefit they tried to claim as a result of the gay lobby and the fight for marriage equality was a lie. Because when they pointed to safe schools, that was the program that had been repealed because people thought it was assaulting their idea of their identity. That was our entire case. Secondly, we told you that it was mutually exclusive to other benefits. And this was so important, because this is why, this is why you couldn't have both safe schools and marriage equality. Every response they gave was literally entirely contingent on proving the, on the thing that I just disproved, which was proving that gay marriage like deconstructs those oppressive narratives. In the dying seconds of Alex's speech, we hear that it's a less abstract goal. We don't see any reason why the goal that gay people should be allowed to be married is a less abstract goal than the gay people, the right that gay people don't deserve to be killed in their schools. Two questions in substantive. Firstly, why the lobby contributes to it for the hegemony of a narrative of integration, mm -hmm. and secondly, why it severs critical ties with the feminist movement. Before I do, Joe. For the black civil rights movement, desegregation was an important precursor to other reforms because it acknowledged their equality under the eyes of the law. Why is this not also true for the gay community and marriage equality? Because when you desegregate schools, it means that black people aren't actively oppressed by having to go to worse schools. When you create marriage equality, it means a small number of gay people get to access a small margin of self-actualization. That's our entire case. Firstly, on the hegemony of the narrative of integration. We don't make any judgement about which of the embryonic and diverse narratives exist within the gay community. That's narratives like saying they need to be integrated with the heterosexual community to become a part of broader society, or saying that they need to reject that society and construct a set of values that mean have meaning to them on their own terms. But we do say that the narrative of integration has been prioritised for the wrong reasons. And that's because it's the narrative that privileged, white, gay, attractive men find compelling and find applies to them. Why is that narrative necessarily exclusive? 
Firstly, it requires you to feel like you can integrate with the heterosexual community. Because for some gay people, the idea of a stable family is empowering to them. But the idea of a stable family isn't empowering when that stable family was the one that kicked you out of your house for being gay. You can never integrate with that community, that's why that narrative is exclusive. But secondly, as we've already elaborated on, it's predicated on the absence, on the presence of material <laughs> wealth. Because you're not capable, no thank you, of being held ransom from those heteronormative narratives when you are poor. And thirdly, it's predicated on narratives of aestheticism. It's predicated on the narrative that you have to have a nice wedding, that you have to look pretty and attractive at your wedding. And that's the exact kind of narrative that attractive gay men in the queer community capitalise on to exclude people, like trans women who haven't transitioned yet. That's the exact kind of narrative that already excludes those people. They make it so much worse. But secondly, why does the, why does the <laughs> aggressive prioritisation, I'll take you in a moment, of gay marriage serve critical ties with the feminist movement? Sure. What do you do for gay men in a stable, monogamous relationship that aren't discriminated in the workplace for whom this is the most important thing they want? So firstly, we mean that the gay men of the future probably aren't going to grow up with incredibly pernicious conceptions of themselves because they weren't bullied at school as a result of our programs. But let's note that literally every benefit they could provide after we eliminated civil unions was the benefits purely of integration into a heteronormative institution. Because insofar as they wanted to make this case about legal rights, gay people already had those exact same legal rights under our side of the house. The difference was whether we prioritized a narrative of integration or a narrative of exclusivity, and that was where we won that question. So, secondly, critical ties with the feminist movement. How does this alienate the feminist movement? Firstly, the feminist movement often doesn't like marriage, but secondly, they feel betrayed because the people they thought were in solidarity with them against the oppression of the patriarchy and now the people who are buying into those exact same patriarchal narratives. That means that the gay movement loses some of their most critical allies. They're critical because they have enormous amount of political capital, but secondly, because they're the people who understand what it feels like to be oppressed by white, straight, gay men. That also makes gay women feel conflicted because they feel like they have to choose the that they feel applies to them the most. We think that's incredibly pernicious. In an ideal world, maybe gay marriage was a goal that we thought the gay community should prioritise, or a thing that would be good to happen in the world. But this wasn't that world. This was a world in, in which the rich gay white men were able to prioritise that movement for their own ends, to find the empowerment that only ever applied to men. And that was political capital, let's be clear, that was stolen from the hands of the children who died hanging in their rooms with the word faggot still ringing in their ears. That was political capital that was so necessary and was wasted on this bizarre movement. So proud to propose. gay marriage was distinct from everything else that the affirmative team wanted to talk about was because at your core if you are a homosexual person and you identify strongly as a homosexual person then you are literally defining your identity by your ability to have a relationship with someone as the, with the, with the, as the same sex as you that was why it was so incredibly important that the state was actually able to acknowledge that not only is that a legitimate relationship but also that that was as equal and as deserving as equality of literally every other uh, every other relationship that exists within society. That was why it was completely distinct from everything else. Equality in the eyes of the state had to come first. I'm going to speak on two issues in rebuttal. First into why marriage equality actually is the most important goal for, uh, for the gay community. And secondly onto why marriage equality actually allows us to achieve better, better reform, actually achieve the things that they wanted to talk about in the future. So, first issue, no thank you. Why marriage equality is in fact the absolute most important goal for the gay community. The, f the first thing we told you that, as I pointed out in my introduction, it is necessary for you to self-actualise through your relationship with members of the same sex. The best way for you to actually do that is if the state is willing to recognise the legitimacy and, equal, uh, and uh, equality of that relationship. They told us that it was only rich white people that were willing to, that actually had interest in putting forth <laughs> marriage equality. We have three responses. First off, that is just absurd. The last time I checked, in general society, the only people getting married are not rich white people. Lots of people want to get married. That, that assertion did not stand. 
The second thing we'd say was that even if there are people who don't feel as though they are in a stable relationship at the moment, everyone has hoped that at some point in the future, they will be in a relationship that is stable enough for them to actually want marriage equality. That was why lots of people got on board, because they hoped that in the future that would be something that they would be able to access. But finally, because even if it is true that this narrative that was one that was dominated by the rich white people, because they had the resources to take away discourse from everyone else, they were also the people who had the resources to actually promote equality, uh, uh, sexual equality to the rest of society. By their own analysis, these people probably wouldn't have cared as much about the other issues because they this was the most important thing for them. And if they felt as though the ma uh, they felt as though the gay community wasn't supporting what was important for them, they probably would have left. You probably would have lost the most influential people, the people who had the capacity to get that message across. The second thing they tell us was that it's buying into a heteronormative patriarchal structure. I'm going to explain in substantive why that is absolutely not the case, and in fact it deconstructs most of their na those narratives. But I'll acknowledge that even if that's not true, it doesn't matter, right? Because we're not forcing every single gay person to get married, we're merely affording them the opportunity. So if indeed they want to buy into those heteronormative patriarchal structures, then they should probably have the right to be able to do that. They also wanted to stand behind other things, like for example better sex education, like for example being able to give blood. But as Xavier criticizes for not explaining why gay marriage was not the most important thing, they also didn't explain why those sorts of things were not more important than gay marriage. They also said that all of those things can also be fulfilled by civil unions. We would say first off that even if you are going into a civil union, that is still symbol symbolically inferior to, to a relationship that is able to get married. That was still something that gay, let the gay community probably would have cared about because they felt as though they were inferior compared to the to any other relationships but also if you wanted to argue behind the importance of the of uh, if you wanted to argue behind the benevolence of civil unions we'd also as we pointed out at Alex the reason why we got civil unions was because there was such strong support for the gay marriage movement and that was sort of seen as a concession to just try and tide that off that was why that point fell to us before I go into my second issue of substantive when Joe was trying to search for a group of gay people you benefited the POI to meet, he pointed to privileged white gay men. Why are they more important than the gay people who go uneducated or die as a result of bullying because of the safe schools program that was repealed as a result of the marriage equality lobby? It is not that they are more important, it is that they were the only people that we could have helped at the time. I'm about to explain why it wasn't true that at that time you could have actually gotten through safe schools, but now we have a much, much better platform to actually push through things like that. So, second issue, why marriage equality allows us to far better achieve future reform. The first, so like the first thing I need to address is that Xavier denied the success of these methods, but he did it in a really weird way, because he denied it, the, he denied its success through the ways that it was actually achieved, through things like plebiscites, through things like judicial activism. We don't think that it would, should actually matter, because at the end of the day, what the wider society sees is that gay marriage is now actually acceptable. It shouldn't matter how that came through, the end result is still the same. But the most important thing for us to acknowledge in this issue was that we got people on board. We got people invested into the gay community. We did that because whilst a, I, like whilst a straight white person probably couldn't conceptualise what it feels like to be bullied every single day because of your sexual orientation, they were someone who probably wanted to get married in the future, which meant they almost certainly could understand what it felt like to be deprived of love and of marriage. That meant that they understood the plight of the gay community and were much better able to actually get engaged and actually care about things. So that didn't just mean that you like you had more people at rallies, but also let's acknowledge that marriage equality rallies didn't focus 100% on marriage equality. They also often did discuss other issues within the brighter within the wider gay community, which meant that just because they had come to support gay marriage, they would also be exposed to all of the other issues that they wanted to talk about. They told you it forced conservatives to double down. We would suggest that because it became incredibly popular to support the gay movement, it actually dragged conservatives to the left. See the fact that the Conservative Party in Australia now supports marriage equality, but also they were probably going to oppose other things like safe schools because as Xavier said, and I quote, safe schools were seen as an assault on their identity. They were always going to oppose those things as well. Two issues in substantive. Firstly, how this affects future members of the community. Secondly, how this affects the feminist movement. 
What the Supreme Court of the United States does is to assess legal arguments, not the public support for gay marriage. That just means it's independent of social movements and the success. How can you claim the biggest success of gay marriage as a result of marriage equality lobby? But that's not true, right? It's impossible to be completely impartial. But also, it was the wider society that elected the president who, who, to represent their views, who appointed that member to the, to the Supreme Court of America. So it wasn't true that they were completely devoid of societal views. So, how this affects future members of the community? First off, as Alex pointed out, it normalised the idea of being homosexual. Because the difference between a civil union and a marriage was that marriage was a big celebration. You probably saw one, you were probably invited to one. That meant that you were undeniably more exposed to it when it was a marriage in a civil union, that means if I'm a closeted homosexual, I probably feel much more comfortable coming out because I know that there are other gay people out there. Secondly, because it increased the credibility of the community. So it created the perception of it as a movement that was actually successful, as a movement that can get things done. That made people want to buy into it. Second issue in substantive, how this affected the feminist movement. So the major thrust of the feminist movement has been breaking down traditional gender roles, which generally manifested itself as showing that women didn't have to stay at home and feed the kids, that they were able to go out into the workplace. How did this, how did gay marriage actually break down that narrative? By showing irrevocably, in a way that otherwise couldn't have been uh, done, that not all marriage consisted of a man and, and a woman. It deconstructed that gender binary, which brought feminists into the fold. That was the reason why we currently have a massive push towards intersectionality in the feminist movement, because they realised that their interests are aligned. So that meant that we got far, far more allies for the gay movement, but it also meant that we benefited every single feminist out there. That was why we were so proud to oppose. Speaker, it was oh so strange that the negative side of this house wanted to say that if you are a gay individual, the only way you can self-actualise is if you know that in the future you'll somehow be able to marry. That is a lie. Self-actualization comes from knowing that you feel safe to be able to come out in school and that you know that if you choose to do that, you won't be bullied to the point where you feel like completely opting out of society, feel like opting out of life because that society doesn't value, uh, value you as who you are. You have the capacity to self-actualise when the state allows you to adopt a child and to recognise the fact that you as a gay individual can look after a child in the exact same way anyone else can. It is when the state says that you don't have different ages of consent when it comes to sexual intercourse with your partners because you are no different. It was so wrong for them to say that the only way to do that was to allow them to marry. No thank you, because the problem was is that all these benefits were oh so much important because they were what drastically impacted <laughs> the lives of these individuals. And every single one of them was mutually exclusive to the massive waste of resources that went into gay marriage. And Tristan said it all when he said, oh, but we couldn't do those things at that time. The reason we could never achieve those goals was because the gay community wasn't willing to get behind them. Instead, it took the road of aggressively prioritising all its support for gay marriage. That meant there was no support behind those important issues like, like anti-bullying campaigns. There was no support behind changing those intentionally oppressive laws. That is why the gay community failed itself when it went down that um, dark road of going after gay marriage at the sacrifice of everything else. Three issues in rebuttal. Firstly, is it a goal worth fighting for? Secondly, how does it benefit the movement? Thirdly, how it relates to feminism? On to this first point. They could never claim any practical benefits to gay marriage because those benefits already exist through the forms of civil unions. They had some weird push at us that like somehow if you guys, you guys would never have had civil unions. What we tell you is that we should have, the gay, gay movement should have stopped there because it was all that time that it spent after it achieved those practical practical outcomes, those legal changes that allowed Innovation. gay people, no thank you, to have proper inheritance laws, to have proper divorce laws, that it was no longer important. Their entire principle relied solely on some sort of vague symbolism that comes from being allowed to marry. Firstly, let's recognise that that is never important. In Tristan's speech, he wanted to say that we needed to prove why bullying programs that stop gay children from killing themselves was somehow more, more important than like a thing that changes the wording on your certificate from civil union to marriage. 
That is blatantly obvious. Secondly, those couples already find gratification in their relationships. That is because, firstly, they can still engage in those relationships. The weird characterisation that they want to say that somehow the state is not endorsing it isn't true considering it is legal to be in a gay relationship, unlike a lot of other countries that they never served to help. But also, there is a very minute difference between your certificate saying civil union and marriage. And this weird thing Tristan wants to say that you somehow can't celebrate a civil union what? Like, if you are getting with your partner and you sign that document to say that you are legally a couple and you have all the rights to that, that still carries those same sorts of social, um, social things that you can engage with. But the most important problem was, is when you opt into that religious, the, when you opt into that institution that is marriage, what you opt into, no thank you, is an inherently patriarchal institution. And that's an institution that could never be changed. Material we brought you at first affirmative and heard no response to. They just counter asserted that when they will create change, they got all these benefits. No logic as to why they do that, apart from saying that somehow it's when you allow gay people to marry, that somehow changed it. What that ignored was the important material we told you about. Marriage is all, always inherently linked to certain parts of that relationship, like having children, but also the history. That means that even if they were able to change it, that change would happen over centuries. And that's, that change, and putting all that effort, effort in all that, over that time, was something that was never important. Their last ditch attempt was to say that, they, that on net, their thing helps more people. That is just not true. Considering the people in the gay community who are most likely to engage this policy are the ones who are rich, are the ones who are white. Joe conceded in a POI when, when he was looking for a group we didn't benefit could only come up with those individuals, but then Tristan said a weird thing about, well look at other marriages, it's not only rich white people. But they're not in the communities that are actively being oppressed, because it is the gay people who are also black that get oppressed so much more. They're the people who never have the capacity to look for marriage, because they're the ones who are aggressively oppressed in society, aren't put into that station of privilege where their policy only benefits them. They were the people that the gay movement, gay, the, the gay movement always needed to help. Second issue, does it benefit this movement? Let's recognise they haven't created change. I'll take one of you in a second. But Tristan lied when he told you about how the Supreme Court works because let's recognise there hasn't been a Supreme Court nomination in a long period of time and it didn't need public support because the Supreme Court doesn't operate on a public voting basis. But also, I never created any more public support before I explain. If the gay community should have stopped at the point at which they got civil unions, are you conceding that they should have prioritised gay marriage up until that point over everything else? No, because civil unions aren't gay marriage. They're different things, as I've already explained. But also, to the extent that that already happened, that is the point where they should have stopped. If that was always a priority, if gay people were being legally discriminated on the basis of inheritance and divorce, then potentially that is an issue you prioritise. When you no longer get those benefits because it's already been achieved from civil unions, you no longer need to further pursue that symbolic benefit when there are other things that are more important. So public support. That public support would have always existed. They had no explanation to this, apart from somehow you ground these policies, whatever that means. Firstly, you don't ground those policies, because a lot of people aren't married and they don't understand what that means to them. But also, let's recognise that a lot of other things people do understand is equally important. Like bullying, like the right to not be bashed in the street. That's something people get behind. I'll take you now. Is it worse to be bullied by a single person at your school or for a whole government to tell you that your form of love is fundamentally illegitimate and you should be segregated to civil unions? That's not what happens. The government still tells you that your form of love is legitimate because you can engage in those sorts of things. But also, it's far, far worse because what you do and something you never respond to is when you push that into marriage. That's what mobilises all the opposition. Opposition that made it harder for any sort of positive change to occur in the future. They could never explain why a progressive who cares about gay marriage, no thank you, wouldn't care about gay people being, being bullied in schools. That meant that that sort of social benefit occurred under both sides of the house no matter what the gay movement was prioritising. Also, no responses to the fact that all the support they got was worsened in the future because it was turned into slacktivism, which made it far harder to actually engage in systems that required proper social capital to change. In regards to opposition, they don't say people listen when the government tells them what to do. That is not what happened in the US when it came to gay marriage. What they believe is not that the government tells them what to do so they believe it. They believe that the government has told them something, the government has got it wrong and is not representing them. That means they opt out of those systems. That's the same logic as to why they somehow asserted that you changed the Catholic Church. That is not what happened. The Catholic Church has doubled down on its policies. 
that Tristan made some weird assertion that that doubling down on safe schools would have happened anyway. No, that ignores the logic of what we told you. The fact is when everyone is focusing on gay marriage, you give opposition the capacity to double down. You give them the capacity to become more aggressive on all those things that are important. That makes the lives of all the people who require those things far, far worse. Their lives are considerably worse off. All their material about future members of these communities was contingent. Thirdly, on feminism, this came out very, very late in the debate. Let's recognise that that also came with absolutely no response to our material. Our material was far more believable because large portions of the feminism movement actively oppose marriage as an institution. Reasons we all brought out and clearly explained. There, Tristan wants to tell us it breaks down a gender binary, but the problem was is that binary still operated under a system that many feminists believe was actively oppressive to women. That means you lose all the intersectionality benefits because the feminist movement and the gay movement won't engage with them. Their lives are so much worse, we don't want to see that very proud to propose. In an ideal world where everyone was pro-homosexuals, we would be able to pass every one of the forms we were able to. Unfortunately, as they admitted, this didn't take place in an ideal world. So the decision of the gay community was to prioritise what they thought they could achieve. What they thought moderates and conservatives could best respond to. Because this is the important thing. They told us that it would be apparently an assault on the identity of, mo of conservatives to promote safe schools. But it's clear that gay marriage doesn't have quite the problem for conservatives, given enough of them have shown their support throughout Western liberal democracies. People couldn't do it at the time. It's not because the gay community was run by evil, rich white men. It's because the gay community was smart enough to realise that society was not yet caught up with them in the places where it needed to be, and they decided to prioritise what they could achieve. Prioritising that has led to a great amount of outcomes. It's an important thing to talk about. Three issues in this speech. Firstly, on whether or not this is a good goal. Secondly, no thank you, on the outcomes for the gay community. And thirdly, primarily on women and the narratives within the gay community. But the first thing we want to talk about is whether or not this is a good goal for the gay community. We gave you a whole bunch of reasons, no thank you, about why individual homosexual people might really, really like marriage. But the most fundamental thing we said is that when your identity, identity as a homosexual person is predicated on your relationships to other homosexual people, the denial of the validity of that relationship is what was wrong with the government. No, thank you. And House Affirmative had a response to this. They called us, they called civil unions. We gave you a whole bunch of reasons why this simply wasn't as good as marriage. But firstly, let's talk about Callum not being unclear of whether or not and why they supported civil unions. So apparently, they support civil unions, right? Which means, no thank you, they support gay marriage or gay unions up until the point of achieving civil unions. And when Tristan asked this to Callum, Callum responded by saying, no, they're very different things. But the reason they brought up civil unions in the first place is by saying it's good enough to have civil unions because it's similar enough to gay marriage. They could never tell us about why gay marriage and civil unions were fundamentally different or similar enough things. What we told you, no thank you, very, very clearly was that it symbolically told you that your love is not as good enough as a heterosexual person's love. No thank you. And for the team that wanted to talk about heteronormativity, we thought it was pretty damaging for the state to say that. So on heteronormativity, so they gave us a lot of talk about this and we think the rhetoric didn't really stand up when we compare it with their harms. So we think that the self-actualisation, no thank you, in this case comes from the choice to be able to buy into that. Because we acknowledge there are some gay people that might never want to buy into this. But the problem was, for the vast majority of gay people, no thank you, who wanted a monogamous, stable relationship, and they wanted one that was recognised as just as good as, not segregated to a civil union. For the vast majority of those gay people, we thought the choice to have that was important. No, thank you. The choice shouldn't be in the hands of the government whether or not it's heteronormative. The choice should be in the hands of gay people who want to get married. And Tristan's 2.2 largely responded, no thank you, to the wing of this that talked about patriarchal institutions. We spoke about how we successfully break down gender binaries and we'll litigate that more in the third issue. So, we think that many gay people maybe want, no thank you, that sort of relationship, and they should be able to. 
We think that the reason it's based on relationships is why the government should support it. They also try to ridicule us for telling, for saying that on net it helps more people. And I'll take you in a moment. We think that the being bullied in a school is not an experience that all gay people experience. We think there are some gay people who might be exempt from that experience, but being told you're loved by the government, your love is not equal to a straight person's, that's an experience that every single person in the gay community suffers. And that's probably why the gay community prioritised it so many years ago. Xavier. The government also says that gay love is not important or not legitimate when it fails to crack down on bullying in schools because it's pretty hard to have a fulfilling relationship when you are dead. Why is gay marriage the magic bullet? Okay, that's where all our pragmatic material comes into play, right? And that's why we think that it's not simply unique to things in school. Because we think that policies like safe schools, as they told us, are really divisive and they'll attack your identity. And we'll tell you more about this in the second issue. Secondly, on outcomes and their idea of it's counterproductive to the gay community. No, thank you. So what did we tell you from first? We told you very clearly that what we saw an unwasteful use of resources is, is something that was attainable, had positive outcomes, no thank you, and was most achievable at the time. Here's the most important thing between the two teams, is we very, very clearly drew the line at what is a waste of resources. Their myriad of attacks on whether or not it's counterproductive ignored the idea that we think if it did achieve good results, it is not a waste of resources, and the result built the foundation from which further gay rights can be achieved. We told you about this. No thank you. We told you that the success of marriage equality has been overwhelming. No thank you. They tried to rebut this by saying it's not as many countries as we like, or it's not the way we'd like. But even if it's not as many countries, or it's not the way you like, the fact is that marriage equality exists in the world. And the fact is that Josh told you that 72% of Australians support marriage equality. That comes from Australians seeing overseas nations and overseas governments endorsing marriage equality. They can also change perceptions in places like Uganda and places like Somalia. They told us that apparently it seizes the political capital from the kids who were bullied. No, thank you. And apparently it, cons it mobilises conservatives to attack this. Conservatives are far, far more susceptible to things they can't identify with. Things they go, oh, that's weird. I don't get that. Marriage is not one of those things. No, thank you. Being bullied at school, not being allowed to donate blood, are some of those things. No, thank you. But the more important thing here is that the goals of gay marriage built a foundation to achieve the rest of the goals. A conservative, and I'll take you in a moment, a conservative who accepts gay marriage is far more likely to then be open to accepting other forms because you didn't start them off with the most abhorrent thing. That's why we could achieve all the reforms of the affirmative team and we could achieve them with support of Parliament. How? You're right when you say conservatives can relate to marriage because the exact line of rhetoric they use is that by allowing gay marriage, you're allowing attack on the fundamental identities of every single married person in a nation. How does that stop moderates from allying with the conservatives when you give them a common ground to fight against gay marriage? We think the common ground they're probably more going to respond to is, I can never get married in my life, then my marriage is slightly devalued. If those are the alternative arguments proposed by the gay community and the conservatives, we think they'll fade that. But more importantly, we think that the conservatives, that's a large minority of them, and the large majority has been shown to support this. So they told us that a homophobic response doesn't endorse the government. We tell you that people will eventually follow the way the government goes. We made that very clear. The important question in this issue is what could we have actually done with our time? Because whilst it would have been great to spend all our resources on the policies they supported, they would never have been achieved. That's why their policies would have been a waste of resources and why we can achieve them now. Onto this third issue about women. Tristan gave you a really well detailed point about why the major thrust of the feminist movement was about breaking down traditional gender roles. We think anything that breaks down a binary in marriage is good for women. Anything that says marriage isn't this black and white is good for women. We told you that. They told us that it alienates feminism and forces them to align in a particular way. We didn't think that was overly true given the vast majority of feminists will probably align with the gay community and marriage equality, as we've said, isn't an overly controversial opinion to have. That's why we support it. Because we're the side of the house that knew what was achievable. We are the side of the house that couldn't bring powder to oppose. Thank you. Yeah! The reason why marriage equality at the end of this debate had to come before literally every other thing that they wanted to talk about was because at the end of the day, if I identify as a homosexual, 
And as I pointed out at me, and as we heard, a startling lack of response to, I am literally defining my identity by my relationship with another sex. Even if the state is willing to acknowledge that to some extent through a civil union, the fact that it is willing to deny me the basic rights that are afford afforded to essentially every other relationship still makes me feel as though my relationship is inferior, still makes me feel as though my identity is inferior, and that was something that affected pretty much every single homosexual, every single lesbian, whether they wanted to get married or not. Two questions in this reply. Firstly, why marriage equality is the most important goal for the gay community, and secondly, why this policy came, did this policy actually come at the consequence of other policies? On the first, why marriage equality is the most important thing. They told you that it was only in the interests of rich white people. I gave you two responses as to why that was absolutely not the case, two responses that are still standing at the end of this debate. Those were that most people probably want to get married, but even if I'm not in a stable relationship, I probably hope to be in that relationship at some point in the future, which means that marriage equality is still something that I want to fight for. What that all meant was that it wasn't true that only a minority of people actually wanted gay marriage. In fact, it was the vast majority of that community, which meant that it was something that they probably should have prioritised. But I also explained why even if that wasn't the case, even if it was rich white people who were just commandeering that, co that community for their own purposes, I told you that still was a good thing because it actually got them in, on board in a way that they probably wouldn't have otherwise. It got all their resources behind that community when they wouldn't have if, they, if their interests weren't actually represented. That was something that we didn't hear a response to. On the issue of heteronormity, once again, I explained why I deconstructed that narrative in my, uh, why I, we deconstructed that narrative in my substantive. Callum's response was to just blankly assert that it didn't respond to Xavier's material and Xavier's material was better, but at the end of the day, those two materials were different, which meant that that material stood, still stood. We still deconstructed that binary. We still stopped the heteronormative patriarchy. But also, we told you that if gay people want to opt into those systems, then they should have the right to do so. That was another thing that we pointed out at me and at Joe. We also told you that it undercut a lot of homophobic rhetoric, in that homophobes are able to look at a homosexual person and say that the state itself does not recognise your relationship, your relationship is inferior, and that is why I'm going to bully you. This also acknowledged that they wanted to stand behind civil unions as an alternative. I explained why that was still inferior and be perceived as inferior to other relationships. But also, Callum conceded that, at, that we should have prioritised the push for gay marriage at some point, at least until we got civil unions. So, second issue, did this policy come at the consequences of other policies? And I'll acknowledge that we definitely do not need to win this, given that I've already proved that, the other, that gay marriage was in fact the most important. So, on this issue, we told you that we get far, far more allies behind these movements, because it's seen as rather esoteric to give blood. It's seen as rather esoteric to be denied sex ed classes, whereas everyone understands what it feels like to be deprived of love or not being allowed to marry. That was why you got people behind the movement. On the issue of feminism, once again, Callum's only response was to lie and tell you that, it had that a lot of feminists have moved away from the LGBTQTI movement, something that I like, rebutted when I told you that in fact there'd been a massive trend towards intersectionality. On conservatives doubling down, once again, that was just a lie, which didn't stand up in the fact that I brought, which is the LNP, Conservative Party gets behind gay marriage, and the fact that Joe bought, which was that the Catholic Church itself has started to be more lenient to homosexuals. At the end of the debate, what that meant was that the, our pol as a result of our policy, we had gotten literally millions and millions of more people to actually care about the LGBTQTI community. That enabled us to actually get through the policies that they wanted to talk about in the future. That was why this debate fell to the negative team. It was genuinely quite amusing to see the benefits that the negative team tried to claim in this debate taper so aggressively from first speaker to third speaker. Because at first we heard that marriage is the vehicle for other social narratives that emancipate gay people. It says that gay people are the same. We then point out that saying that gay people don't deserve to be bullied and killed in their high schools also says that they are the same. That's swiftly dropped. 
Then they say that the important thing is it's about having relationships and that being gay is a necessary precursor to caring about relationships. We point out that you have to be alive to have a relationship. And in that sense, all the other things we pushed for also required you to promulgate narratives that said that gay people should endorse those relationships. Finally, at third, we hear that gay marriage is an easy battle, and that's the reason why we should support it. But that stood in the face of numerous reasons we gave you as to why our battles were also easy. Because they didn't force conservatives to double down when, although they may be homophobic, they didn't feel like it was their marriage being assaulted. They didn't feel like it was their religion that they were being forced to disavow. That's why we won this debate. Two questions in reply. Firstly, is this a good goal for the gay community? Secondly, does it emancipate queer people? The first thing to note at the start of this first issue is that by the end of this debate, there was no difference in the material rights provided to gay people. This was about which set of heteronormative narratives they should buy into. We didn't say that literally every gay person hated narratives of monogamy and wanted to be as promiscuous or to disavow those heteronormative marriage, uh, marriage institutions being, as being distasteful. And it was so problematic that that was the only claim that ever really garnered a response. What we actually did say is that a significant number of gay people don't feel like that and do find those narratives distasteful. And that was for two reasons. Firstly, it was because of historical associations of monogamy and historical associations of the oppression of the use of marriage as a tool of patriarchy that could never really be disavowed for reasons we gave and that were mostly ignored. That was why the fact that most people wanted to get married didn't apply to most queer people wanting to get married. That was the nuance we missed. That also meant that their point about feminism fell because they didn't actually deconstruct the binary. Secondly, and probably more importantly, we pointed out that being a queer person who advocated for gay marriage would mean that you were a queer person who necessarily was privileged. That was firstly because you had enough money to be in a stable and committed relationship that allowed you to have a marriage, and secondly, and much more importantly, that you didn't feel so rejected by society that you didn't feel you could buy back into that. That was probably one of the most important things we said, and it got literally no response. But let's be clear, at the end of this issue, they relied on proving that the endorsement of relationships for gay people had to come from the state. We thought gay people were comfortable in their love and to the extent that they needed someone to tell them their love was okay, that should not be the state that had oppressed them for so long. Secondly, on the emancipation of queer people. We conceived of this debate around them trying to prove that the things we advocated weren't mutually exclusive, but remarkably they did very little of that, instead trying to bizarrely claim at points that bullying programs in high schools are not necessarily good goals. Callum pretty swiftly dealt with that and it was dropped from the rest of their case. Why was it mutually exclusive? It was firstly because there was limited political capital for gay people to advocate for concessions from a government. It was secondly because this policy uniquely, gar uniquely garnered conservative rhetoric in a way that things like bullying programs didn't do. Because you might be homophobic and you may want gay people to be bullied in schools, but it doesn't feel like an assault on your own marriage or assault on your own religion. That was why gay marriage had to be, have enormous benefits proved to justify that enormous garner of conservative rhetoric. We also point out that it contributed to the prevalence of slacktivism, which meant that every future concession for poor would be one that would be harder to get, that again got no response. So, did gay marriage actually achieve benefits? First, the first thing they do is lie about the fact that the LNP supports gay marriage and lie about the fact that the Catholic Church supports gay marriage. That didn't get them very far. All these benefits were largely dealt with my introduction when I pointed out that they were not, they were not exclusive to a narrative and a prioritisation of gay marriage. But let's note that they didn't even achieve gay marriage in the case. And every response they gave, like, oh, it doesn't matter because it was achieved in an imperfect way, didn't respond to the nuance we gave, which was the way in which it was achieved meant that it was not the gay rights lobby that achieved it. It was judges in the Supreme Court. It would have happened anyway. All the important material we gave you about the unfair homogenisation of narratives of integration was literally ignored. Theirs was a gay community, and theirs was a case that was stuck in the narratives of a gay community that always prioritised what, what, what a, a privileged white gay men found appealing and found empowering. We were so proud to support a queer lobby that didn't just prioritise those people's interests, but prioritised the interests of all queer people. And that was why we won this debate. <laughs>
the, this decision decides the premiership as well. So, with that suspense done, um, I would like to say that I've given the debate by a close but clear margin of 3.5 points to the affirmative team. and said that only some gay people define themselves by relationships and that only some of them are monogamous and to only some of them marriage is something that gives them value to their life and that it buys into the narrative of a nuclear family and things like that. The negative team then responded by saying that people are defined by their relationship to someone of the same sex and so therefore marriage equality affects every single gay person. To that I, bought, I believed that belief. However, we then need to think about how this effect was actually going to affect people. I thought the affirmative team very cleverly said that civil unions deliver the same legal rights and so therefore the only <coughs> difference practically to gay people was a symbolic difference. I think the negative team argued effectively that the symbol says that that relationship is inferior. However, the affirmative team very well, very, argued very well that fighting that symbolism comes at the cost of other things. I think it was in this them proving that in which they were able to win the debate. Firstly, I think the affirmative team clearly proved that this creates more opposition to the LGBTIQ community. How? Because they said that what it means is when gay people change the way that other straight people define their marriage, that affects religions and that affects moderates and conservatives much more than bullying programs and things like that. And I think that the affirmative team was able to prove to me that you would be able to create more opposition than less if you had have just pursued an anti-bullying program or things like that. The, affirmative, the negative team did say that, gay, that straight people can relate to marriage more, however I thought it was for that reason that it, they were more likely to oppose gay marriage and marriage equality for that reason. So I thought the affirmative team on the first issue of the external harms. The second issue was whether or not the gay community could have pursued other targets instead, things like bullying campaigns, gay panic, youth suicide, etc. I think the negative team argued, but not very explicitly and not as clearly as they could have, that gay, you need gay marriage first before you can get other benefits. You said, for instance, Tristan said that you need the wealth of the, um, gay, the privileged gay people in order to do this. However, the affirmative team really clearly said that pursuing gay marriage was not unique to pursuing other things in order to break down harmful narratives. For instance, the right for children to be in high school and not be bullied carries the same weight and narrative of them being all the same. So, because I believe that suicides and bullying and things like that were much worse for the gay community affected a great number more people than the symbolic benefit to a privileged few, and this also caused more opposition to LGBTIQ rights, and it also brought into a harmful narrative, that is why I gave the debate to the affirmative team. But, round of applause everyone for doing such a good job. <laughs> Ten, nine,